This channel is not intended for children. Please kickstart responsibly. Hey everybody, so this is going to be one of those episodes where I'm pushing the 5,000 character limit in the description. So we'll just fit in as much as we can. This says uh, December week 2. It'll probably go fully to the end of December. I'm trying to get to uh, around the 21st, maybe. We'll see how far that, that gets me. Um, and uh, we'll go from there. Lots of stuff is coming out. There's a bunch of things in board games, or a bunch of things, RPGs, all that kind of fun stuff. There, for the whole month, will likely be a bunch of short campaigns that are trying to get your Christmas money. And um, it's going to extend. It's already extending through January. Fun fact, not everybody in the world has Christmas on the 25th. Some of them celebrate it on New Year's, and some of it celebrate like within the first week. It depends on the orthodoxy. Uh, so there's Russian Orthodox and a bunch of other ones that celebrate it in January. All the other kinds of things all over the world. It's crazy. Um, however you celebrate it, it's probably going to hopefully be with some days off and uh, you can play some games. And uh, if you really want to get something special for someone and you're going to play the long game, you can order it on Kickstarter from one of these things and it'll arrive by next year, hopefully. Let's take a quick look and see what's there. We'll start off with King Hung Era. This is... A Chinese game that was taught to the creator by his grandmother and he's adapted it for Western pieces uh, that use chess pieces so um, you'll have to take a look at the rules it's gonna be one of the two-player games similar to what chess would have if you're looking for something to replace some chess pieces and you want to move on to tiles then that's another option for why you might want to get this game um, you could use it for some other artwork or that type of thing. Not terribly expensive for what it is. And, uh, you know, it's just one of those two-player games. Uh, it says it could go to four players, which is also pretty cool. Um, that uh, it's competitive, uses some simple rules, plays pretty quickly. And that's about as much information as I have about it. If you're looking for something that's kind of interesting and based on uh, Chinese folk stuff, history, then uh, this might be your game. King Hung Era. And something that's not game related, but a lot of game people might enjoy. This is a comic book artist, Frank Cho. He has done lots of really interesting, uh, especially known for drawing women, um, because he doesn't necessarily draw stick thin or anime style. He tries to be a little closer to um, reality and it gives them some musculature, makes it look like they've eaten in their lives. It's a little bit different in the way that he puts things out there. Um, so Jungle Queens, and uh, you can see a Lady Death down there, and other kinds of interesting stuff. 20 years in the business. I've got some of his books, that's why I get notifications when he comes out with a new one. And I can tell you, the guy knows what he's doing, the art is really good. Um, there's an opportunity there to learn a lot about how to maintain anatomy. They don't all have to look exactly the same. Um, one of the tendencies for people who draw women especially is to only give them one single body shape and um, it's boring. <laughs> there should be lots, lots of personality and things that can define a human being. Um, yeah, it's, it's interesting and cool stuff and uh, I just appreciate what his work is and like to share that with more people if they'd also like to enjoy Frank Cho's work. Then we have a Darwin-based game and there was one last week if you want to check in on that one uh, from before, but I like this one a little bit better in the sense that it is about his travels in the Galapagos Islands in the 1800s and on the HMS Beagle. Um, you have to examine the birds and other species. He was uh, specializing in finches and how their beaks and sizes and other parts of their anatomy were uh, specialized for gathering certain types of food, how they've differentiated themselves as separate species. And I think that's really, really cool how um, this game does a better job of kind of explaining that scientific process and cataloging the various animals and, you know, cataloging their traits and trying to discover their histories based on that. I think it's really, really neat. Um, and I like this one. Of the options that have existed so far for Darwin-based games, I think this one's a little bit better than just mashing animals together. I think it's more fun and you can tell a story. We'll have a little bit of uh, Robinson Crusoe in with it. Not uh, the game, but, you know, the character in the sense of someone who's sitting on this vast and interesting island and what they find out. Um, I think it'd be a fun game to play with your kids. This says 9 and up, but I think if you're a creative parent, you can play it with just about any age. A few years back, Rising Sun came out from Come On, and it was a pretty cool miniatures game. 
and I joined the Facebook group for it, and they had a post that said, just like Rising Sun, but with meeples, small samurai. And that's what we have, small samurai empires. And that's pretty much what it is. You can see Japan there as a map with all the little squares and whatnot. And you got little samurai meeples that uh, fight back and forth. And uh, it's a two to four player game. So very similar in that sense to Rising Sun. If you uh, wanted a game in that feudal Japan world and you didn't want something that was as big or clunky or, uh, you know, just have to paint as much stuff as you do with a miniatures game and you want something uh, easier to put on the table, then maybe you want Small Samurai Empires. Maybe you just want another one because you played so much Rising Sun. Small Samurai Empires on Arcana or Archana. I think it's Arcana. Games has you set up. And for the war gamers in the crowd, we have three different games. That's the Thunderbolt, Apache Leader, Fleet Commander Leader, and Tiger Leader for land, sea, and air battling. Uh, lots of neat stuff, the type of stuff you'd expect, realistic military planes, ships, tanks, that kind of thing, maps, etc., along with, uh, you know, movement patterns and other neat stuff. I'm not the biggest war gamer in the world uh, by any stretch, but I'm sure some of you are into that and uh, will enjoy being included with, uh, you know, knowledge of this type of stuff being out there for you guys to play in, uh, in your games. Then we have Zoned Out. This is a simplified version of SimCity, basically, where you set up different zones. You have, um, you know, residential, commercial, that kind of thing, and that allows you to develop a city. Sounds easy, right? Pretty much the same thing that uh, we've been playing uh, as video games since the 2000s era. Um, you know, SimCity 2000. Maybe that was the late 90s. I don't remember, but uh, that's what it feels like to me. Simplified stuff doesn't seem like it would be too complicated to play with your kids and uh, you know otherwise it's it just looks like a neat little tile laying game uh, for some type of urban planning then we have not your mahjong and what it's not your mahjong is that normally mahjong takes place with or is used utilizes that's the word I'm looking for tiles instead of cards this uses cards instead of tiles so that you can more easily connect to what's going on they use pictures that describe um, the, you know, they have a scene going on so you can tell a little bit more of the difference rather than Chinese characters that you probably do not read. If you live in the United States or the rest of the Western world, it is pretty, uh, you know, there's a pretty far majority that does not read Chinese. So uh, what they do is they simplify it and uh, make it so that you can tell what's going on in the game with the cards instead, something that you might be more familiar with. Not a bad idea. Not a bad idea at all, if this is something that you want to give a shot, um, or you have always been interested in Mahjong, and you don't otherwise have the instructions or know how to play, then maybe this is like your first baby steps into playing that game. Then we have a card game that is cooperative instead of competitive, like most of the other stuff we've seen so far today, Global Crisis, the game of future Earth. So this is a game that takes place in uh, the 23rd century, I believe, and it has the same kind of problems that we have today. And you have social issues, inequality, materialism, and you can fight that with insight, enlightenment, and virtue. And you have uh, basically analogs of uh, the United States and Asia and other stuff um, for the future. So if you want to continue to fight the good fight and hopefully the earth doesn't uh, explode or whatever crazy thing get hit by a meteor uh, in that future tense, um, and uh, you want to look at those various issues and you want the uh, pleasure of explaining them to your 10 year old without uh, scaring them into having nightmares, feel free to, to do this. Otherwise, I'd say maybe closer to a teenager would, uh, would be a better age to have uh, a playtime with this kind of thing, especially because of um, just how horrible being beat down by the police and other stuff like that can be. And uh, a kid might not have to worry about that. How about a game about a simpler time? This is Glory, a game of knights, and it is a combination of worker placement and jousting. This is solo capable, first one so far on the list. That part is pretty cool, and uh, it's going to play in about 30 minutes. So the artwork looks all right. Doesn't look like anything super complicated or crazy. It, uh, you know, you have to follow the same basic functions of worker placement, but now it's in a tournament of uh, the medieval world. 
it's a neat theme. It's a good introduction into fantasy. It's, you know, fantasy adjacent. And, uh, you know, it might be something that your kids would also be interested in. Or you just need uh, a quick 30-minute lunch break game. Why not? Then we have a neat card game, Dino Oblivion. This is where you have a fictional land where dinosaurs and cave people coexisted. And you have to collectivize your, uh, your world and your tribe and take out giant dinos that would otherwise eat you. So it's a little bit of deck building, a little bit of tableau building, a little bit of resource management, and uh, you know a lot of cool stuff leads up to a game they say is about 45 minutes long, but you can play it with a friend or play it by yourself, and that's always a good option to be able to uh, have it for a lunch break on your own. Dino Oblivion, little cartoony in the uh, artwork there, but that's not necessarily a problem for everybody. Even if this artwork looks familiar, there's a reason for it. Uh, it is a repurpose of some other D&D modules that have been created by Tim Krause. If you didn't want the modules themselves, you just wanted to have the monsters, this is your chance to get a 75-page book of just those monsters. And uh, it's a great idea. If uh, you didn't want to get all the other modules, you just wanted to have uh, something like they have the werebears here and badger people and other crow people and other kind of cool stuff. Um, you can implement it as many different ways as you want. There's uh, a lot of options right now with His Dark Materials on HBO being popular. Alter Quest is going to be shipping soon. It has Crow People. Um, there's different reasons why you might want to do these particular uh, types of animals and uh, all the other 72 or 71 pages worth of other stuff uh, that could be included. So give a quick look at what they've got on offer. Maybe you want to get the modules themselves and you can contact that company about it and uh, have those adventures or just integrate it however you want in your own. Then we have another one of these popular mint tin games. They fit in a small package because it doesn't really require much else. It is a game about a conversation about whether or not the cat is dead. Um, based on Schrodinger's original thought experiment. Um, as you can see, these are components that they made in paper, so it'll have different components in the final version. Um, but if uh, this is something that you want to argue back and forth with your friends about and uh, try to have a, a neat social deduction game about which characters are lying and which characters are not lying and what the real state of the cat is, it could be fun. It's a nice, cheap game. It doesn't need to be overly expensive or overly uh, overdone. It's just, you know, you have the host and then you have the people that uh, argue back and forth. It is uh, as simple as it needs to be to have the same fun outcome. Then we have a game about logistics on the Russian front of World War II. This is Race to Moscow. Um, it's, it might fool you that it's a war game, but it's not necessarily a war game. It is more about the movement of supplies while other companies and other... Um, just other factions are trying to blow up the bridges that you're using and you have to then put it on a truck. Um, just different things as you try to get supplies to your uh, the, your troops that you have out on the front line. And you're getting them from your home base and you're moving them out there. So you can see on the left you have like the grain sacks and other cool stuff. But then on the right you have the other tanks and other things. So the real way you win is getting the supplies across. But one of the ways that you... Uh, mess with the other players or that you defend yourself is with the tanks so um, it's a little bit more logistics driven than you would normally see in a war game which is not a bad thing at all because uh, without ammunition without food without other supplies you have no army and uh, it's an interesting way to think about it where it's more than just how many troops you can throw at a thing you got to feed them too then we have a game that may be of limited audience, but this may be perfect audience for it. This is a complicated board game, the card game. So you have a bunch of cards that utilize things that are, or mechanics that are in more complicated board games. So if you've played a lot with other, a lot of other people, they'll understand the concepts of it. So, uh, yeah, there's some solo rules. There's uh, uh, lots of different ideas. The artwork is... I would say about as good as you get on Adventure Time, um, but yeah, it's 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 otherwise just a neat little game, especially for get board game groups that uh, play a lot of games, and you know you get the meta 
humor involved with it. And we'll follow that up with Mint Condition. This is a comic book collection game. So the cards themselves have all of this comic book looking art. They've got values on them and you are doing the best you can to create the best collection of comics. So you can see that there's an anime one, there's a Breakfast Club, I'm, I guess that's like, uh, I don't know, I don't know what that is. And then there's Kids with Powers, maybe it's like Power Pack, Captain Impossible, Grimm and Malware. Yeah, so it's it, there's no actual story or anything to go with it. Um, it would be great if that came about as a uh, stretch goal or something like that. Um, but uh, right now it would just a way to throw comic book art at you and then you uh, you do the best you can to collect the full set and that will maximize the value of the comic. Um, and you trade with the store and back and forth to pick, pick the best things that you possibly can do. Um, yeah, it's, it's like a kid simulator. Thanks to Hollywood, swords seem to get all the, the fancy attention, but it is the lowly spear that is the heavy lifter for most of humanity. You can throw it at stuff, you can plant it in the ground, you can uh, create a phalanx and all kinds of cool stuff, such as what will happen in Clash of Spears. This is a Roman uh, era, Roman Empire era game that has a bunch of different factions and other stuff, but is giving true um, credit to the spear itself. Why? Why is it so uh, important? Why does it mean so much? Well, it's cheap. That's one thing. It doesn't take as much uh, metal as a sword would, and wood grows you know, on trees. Come on, man. That, you know that part's easy. So you can always make more of them. Um, you can also plant them in the ground when you're putting your phalanx together. So you can put your shield down and plant the the spear down uh, behind your foot or whatever the case is. And as the enemy runs at it, then you won't be pushed back as easily. Lots of good reasons for for having spears uh, out there. Swords usually. Once you lost your spear, um, then you, they were shorter so that you can come around and hit with your shield. Put all that together and you got a hell of a skirmish game. That's what Clash of Spears is intending to have. Then we have a role-playing game from a lot of the people that used to work over at TSR. And this is Giant Lands. The guys I'm talking about are Stephen Dinehart, James M. Ward, Ernest Gygax Jr., and Larry Elmore. They've been around for quite a while. Um, one of the guys even did one of the first expansions for Dungeons and Dragons first edition. So, uh, yeah, they're just trying to find something new. They're creating a world. Uh, if you were to follow, uh, some mythologies like Greek mythology, depending on which one you read, giants came first and then humans come after. And that's kind of the, the feel of what's going on. A various set of ages of the world being wiped out and then coming back with newer critters, uh, eventually leading to other civilizations. And, uh, yeah, they've, uh, they've got a couple of dozen people already in there and they could always use some more if you're into, uh, a world built by the people that, uh, helped start it all. Take a look at giant lands. It's a fresh start. And if you were looking for an excuse to do your best golem impersonation, this is Gollum teeth. Sorry. Goblin teeth. Oh my. You know what it is? It's the video they were doing the golem impersonation and that's totally thrown me off. Anyway, this is a game about cheating and sacrifice, because you're going to sacrifice to uh, the big boss head guy, and uh, you're going to cheat the other players to get the best sacrifice away from them. So uh, you're still going to play by the rules, but inside those rules there are cheat cards that allow you to do various things. So uh, you have to have a couple players. Obviously, you can't just keep, sit there cheating yourself. And uh, yeah, it, it sounds interesting. Um, it could be fun. Uh, it's a little easier to be competitive when the uh, cards themselves are giving you the ideas on how to cheat. A lot of people, they want to play things by the rules, and uh, yeah, it's just an interesting way to, to approach that. Now for a game I know almost nothing about, and that's not the board game, that's skiing. I am one of the urbanites that doesn't live in cold weather and have never been skiing. So when I see this on the Winter Olympics, it is like it's from an alien planet. Probably Hoth. Anyway, uh, Ski Tour by Athlon is for the other people who live in non-tropical climates or are just really into skiing. Um, yeah, it's a downhill uh, skiing and then 
no, I might have that wrong. It looks like they build a track of various types of difficulty because this is the one where you're kind of under your own power and then you have to somehow bring your heart rate down and then shoot a bunch of targets. I believe that's what the biathlon is. And um, so this offers lots of replayability, so that part's good. And much like many video games did for me, uh, exposing me to a lot of different other worlds I wouldn't have any interest in, uh, and understandings about how certain things go by creating a game aspect. This could be something great to bring people into the understanding of how the biathlon works. Maybe they'll get some more athletes involved with it. I don't know. Uh, but it is something that uh, is interesting to put out there. Uh, I'm not sure if this is a Winter Olympics year, but if it is, then uh, it's a great time for this to come out. And if one samurai game wasn't enough, then we have another one. This is Way of the Samurai, and this is a solo game. A solo game exclusively plays pretty quickly and you are using various techniques to win in a sword battle that's the whole point um yeah if you let's you know, we know i brought up rising sun before let's say you bought rising sun and you didn't get to play it because you couldn't get any enough players around that would sit around and actually you know sit through a whole game well and then you need a solo game and maybe you can use the same kind of um feel if it's something that you're already interested in then uh, this could be very helpful in putting that together the card art looks pretty neat um the art that they have there on the left is probably going to be on a box or something like that has very little to do with what you'll find in the actual cards but uh, all in all it looks like a, a simple game that uh you know you could play lunchtime and keep within a theme if you've already got games like this uh for yourself and we have Dare to Play, which is a trivia game that mixes uh, punishments with dares. So if you get it right, great, you get your points. If you get it wrong, then you pull a dare card. And text the 10th person in your contacts list, I love you. Twerk on your Instagram story. You don't necessarily want to do this. <laughs> um, while they may have these things in there, I'm not sending anything to my boss. I'm like, oh, let's play a game. Over. I work with high-level executives from the top media companies in the world. I'm not going to risk that. Now, if you work for McDonald's and you just have a bunch of friends that are 19 years old or 17 years old, then maybe this works pretty well. Um, but I don't like the dare thing, especially when it involves like having to t send weird things to other people. Because now you're just messing with other people. Like, oh, the game told me to. You just seem like a moron. Um, so I'm a little... You might want to cull the dares that are in this thing. If you do pick that up. Because it might be a fun party game. But I'm old. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, maybe when I was like in my early 20s. It would be like the limit of, uh, of when I could have done this kind of stuff. And uh, it would have been worth it. And it's like, fill your shoe with water. I wear flip-flops because it's hot in the summer. There's no filling that shoe. Then we're on to Family Plot, which is an expansion, but really it's a new box and some other stuff that comes with the original base game. So, yeah, it kind of fills it all in. You can also get those little plushies. There is the Darth Poodle, uh, which is probably the thing you're going to go for, and then the cute little uh, baby Jack Skellington-looking uh, artwork thing that's there. The whole point of the game is you're trying to take a bunch of pop culture type of uh, characters and build a family out of them. You have a, uh, a list of things to build your family tree, and everyone else is trying to kill them. And uh, if you can survive uh, and, and build your tree, then you win. And that's basically how it works. So, uh, yeah, some interesting options. Um, a unique Darth Poodle thing that you could put on your table, and some people might go just for that. And uh, otherwise, you know, a competitive card game that uh, could be a lot of fun and uh, has a lot of interesting stuff. As you can see, Yorkie Chew, that would obviously be Chewbacca, but in the shape of a Yorkie. Um, and other cool stuff that, uh, you know, just uh, tickles all the, the, the fun centers of the brain and all the nostalgia centers at the same time. We have a game that puzzles me a little bit because everyone in the video has a British accent, but it's supposed to be made in Cheyenne, Wyoming. Throws me off just a little bit there. But anyway, Magnate is uh, kind of like uh, what would happen if Monopoly had fun, I guess. Yes. Um, you're building a city, you're building, uh, you're developing plots of land, so it's not like you just land on the thing and then you buy it up. You actually have to 
uh, take it from the ground up and then you can sell the building for a profit rather than just buying it out so you get some reward for your investment works a little bit more like how the market actually functions and uh, there's certain things you can do if you're constantly pushing um, different neighborhoods and whatever that you can end up with a market crash and that's how the game ends so it's a little bit like monopoly in the sense that you're buying up territories running around the board um, but it's much more complicated than that and uh, more like the real world setting up markets and uh, manipulating them in various ways uh, yeah it's uh it's kind of neat then we have a new rpg this is vigor into dust and they call it a character forward rpg with a simplified 60 system and what it does is it takes you into the survival world and it gives you role play prompts in the forms of what they refer to as threads which is like a character drive uh roots which is like a background and natures which is some type of character either uh, boon or flaw or whatever the case is and uh, you're set off on a journey the idea being to allow for collective storytelling but otherwise being in a rule simplified kind of system not a lot of big information on uh, like high fantasy monsters or anything like that but uh, just kind of surviving what the world is so interesting way to go about it and uh, different type of storytelling something you might want to keep in your toolkit for uh, you know game night then we have some models celebrating the women of World War II in the British home front. This has uh, the lumber jills doing the uh, hard work out there, getting all the wood ready. Then you have people on tractors and uh, the so-called land army. Um, then there's the little, you know, respected, little-known pigeons that would have been everywhere uh, before they went extinct in the U.S. I'm not sure what the pigeon situation is like in the U.K., uh, those are carrier pigeons that went extinct in the U.S. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's a lot of good stuff to uh, to fill the table with, um, or you could put a character to use, depending on uh, what it is that you're you're going for, either for a model or a skirmish game, or even if you have like a World War II era RPG, um, or you just have uh, someone in a old uniform, maybe if you're playing like Delta Green or whatever, maybe. I don't know, you could have somebody that just likes to wear that kind of uniform. Lots of options available to you and something that you won't find uh, on other uh, game lines. Then we have Venice, the city of beautiful waterways, and that's what you're going to be moving around. You get a little uh, gondola with your meeple in it, and you get little bridges uh, made with the, you know, basically meeple style, and uh, you just move stuff around. You can, uh, it's basically a worker placement game, um, but you're smuggling to a degree things around during the Inquisition. So that part's really cool. Uh, shout out to the people of Venice. Sorry you got the terrible, terrible flooding you've got right now. But uh, your city makes for some wonderful, beautiful ideas and games. And uh, yeah, there's that. Then we have Roll to the Top, a new reprint. This time it's going to be laminated. And this is an interesting math game in the sense that you are going to roll dice and use them to construct the building but every put every uh value has to be higher the higher you go than the ones below it so you have to strategize where you're going to put all the different uh, roles and uh you know if you're going to continually roll low you're going to have a hard time uh, building anything on top of it and things are randomized by the plus or minus dies and the uh, the various dice uh values uh as you can see there on the right so, uh, yeah, it's an interesting math game, something you can play fairly quickly. Uh, it's nice to have it laminated so that you can just use uh, well, dry erase markers or whatever the case is. And, uh, you know, something you can compete for time with your friends or whatever you want to do. Kind of neat. Then we have a game that plays like an 80s toy ad. This is Necromolds. And you basically have some form of clay or Play-Doh that you have a spell book which is a mold. So you put the clay into the mold and smash it together and it will create your miniature for a temporary basis. I'm not sure how long it'll take for it to dry out or whatever the case is. If it's petroleum based, then maybe it won't never dry out, which would be fine. And then you're supposed to wear these plastic rings and as you defeat your enemies, you squish it with the ring and it shows your insignia and you know it destroys their the enemies. I don't know how you keep the colors from mixing or any of the other stuff 
um, that you have as an issue when you have Play-Doh, but uh, that's what's going on. Um, you can take a look at the ad that's in the uh, the video for the for, in the description, and uh, yeah, it's just like an '80s toy ad, and I don't know, probably will play a little better because uh, you actually have the game to do something with. Uh, I don't know, it's interesting. It's an interesting uh, throwback. Then we're moving on to a game. Apidea. This is about bees, and I, you know you see a lot of these things becoming a lot more popular. The nature-based games, Wingspan has been ridiculously popular for being such a small game, and uh, you know this is kind of in that same feel. And you have the realistic-looking artwork that is, uh, you know, it's not like it's uh, stylized or made into a cartoon or anything like that. And uh, otherwise, you just have a worker placement game, and uh, you can be very competitive against the other folks. Uh, it is a minimum of two players. We can go up to six, so that part is kind of neat for uh, game night. And you uh, have special abilities depending on the species of bee or wasp or whatever it is that you're going to play as a pollinator. Um, the, it's got meeples, bee-shaped, all that kind of stuff, and otherwise it runs off hexes that you flip over for tiles. So if that sounds good, then get pollinating. Then if that line of World War II women piqued your interest, but you wanted something a little more modern, Hydra Studio has brave women. They have uh, figures and busts. So uh, you can have various occupations. Astronaut, uh, looks like maybe pilot, firefighter, and motorcycle person. Uh, they have a variety of different options available. They look pretty neat, and you can set them up however you like. Uh, if you want someone that, uh, you know, isn't, as stereotypical bikini clad uh, that you find in a lot of other games and you want something uh, a little more uh, professional looking then uh, that would be fine. The poses, not sure all of them uh, work quite as well. Uh, the astronaut pointing to the sky, I mean what are they pointing to? <laughs> what is it just, just I'm going up there? Is that, is that, is that the job description? It's hard to say. Um, you know, the pilot, they've got their, their helmet there, so they're ready for action. Different options available. The sculpts do look pretty neat. Uh, poses, just like I said, you know, you got to have an idea of what's going on and what it is that you want. Then we have some 3D printable terrain for you. This is the Forsaken Lands, and it's like a fantasy ruined building. They have a tower there. They've got what looks like it could be maybe a church or a granary and uh, other rocky outcropping. So a lot of it looks pretty cool. Um, I don't think it would specifically require resin. You could probably do this just uh, as well with FDM printer. Um, and it probably wouldn't look too bad. Uh, all of the moss and everything, you know, it really hides those lines. So, uh, yeah, if you're looking for something to, uh, spice up the terrain a little bit and have your, uh, you know, uh, I don't know. It doesn't look like it comes apart. Uh, some of it has, uh, removable roofs, but it's not fully modular. Um, if you need something like that in order for your uh, your characters to have a place to have a meeting or have a new encounter, maybe it's a good place for a skeleton to pop out. All kinds of neat stuff if possible and uh, 3D printable. And we have a module for the RPG Mothership. And uh, this is about AI out of control, self-replicating into the terrors of a gray ooze. So, uh, yeah, it's zine size, so it's a little, little bit, you know, tiny. But uh, otherwise, it should just give you all of the uh, technological horror you're looking for. So whatever it is that you're looking for in your world, uh, be it chef androids in the cafeteria or whatever the case is, this self-replicating AI will uh, turn it eventually into a level of terror that has never been seen before. It's probably safer out in space than coming down here. You know, if this is your game, if this is what you'd like to play, um, a little bit different than what you'd find in Starfinder, or one of the other ones, um, more of like a operatic type deal. This is more like HAL uh, from 2001 Space Odyssey. So yeah, different, different options. They're all good though. Then we have a big game by a big company. This is Awaken Realms bringing you the Great Wall board game. They uh, are mainly known for doing miniatures games, and this is no different from that if you want it to be. Otherwise, you can get meeples and save some money. So they're doing something really nice for people on that end. 
Uh, having the uh, Chinese theme, though, is is very different. They did uh, This War of Mine, Edge Dawnfall. Um, they did uh, Lords of Alice. They did all kinds of stuff, but nothing in that Asian space. So this is an interesting way to go there. Uh, I just received my Tainted Grail from them this week, and I've got Ether Field still on the way. So uh, I've got plenty from them to play through. So I think I'm going to personally uh, skip this one because the Chinese theme doesn't really do much for me. But it does have beautiful miniatures. It has a beautiful board, artwork, and everything is all up to par because uh, that's what they do best is uh, make great minis and uh, interesting uh, games and themes. So if you have other Waken Realm stuff, then this is uh, going to have that same level of quality, but it's going to be completely different, because that's what they also do, is make completely different games from one another, uh, so that uh, it keeps you interested all the time. Take a quick look. Then we have Museum Deluxe Edition. If you ever wanted to be a competitive curator of museum displays and uh, collections, then this is the game to get you started on that path. The yeah, it looks pretty cool. Uh, it's around placing, uh, I'd say, late 19th century. Um, but, you know, you have a lot of neat things that uh, the world has discovered and people have found. And uh, that makes it in the public, uh, <laughs> uh, for public consumption, so you can throw Stonehenge in there and not have it worry, uh, worry about uh, having to pay for any licensing fees. So it's a smart idea to make a game like this, because you can put whatever you want in the artwork. Um, its cultural significance and other stuff, including the, uh, the idea that maybe we'll uh, look a little further into why these things are included, what makes them special, where they're at in today's museum. So uh, it's the type of game that, yeah, it can be a fun game, but I think it will have other benefits uh, to pique curiosity. And if that was too highbrow for you, then uh, Double Turn Games has you covered with Smack Talk Showdown, which is the competitive world of smack talk in the wrestling uh promos that's what you're doing you're talking trash you're using the prompts to build the best wrestling promo possible it's a good way to be creative uh let loose all that testosterone whatever you got going on then uh, smack talk showdown is uh you know just a fun way to to trash talk and not get in trouble then we have what's probably the last campaign I'm going to back this year. Dawn of Madness. I've been waiting for it. It's uh, another game from Dimension Games in the world of Deep Madness. Uh, but it takes place in the 20th century, early 20th century, whereas Deep Madness takes place in the 21st, or late 21st, early 22nd century. And that uh, kind of thing. And it's about going through your nightmares, whatever they may be. Uh, every single sculpt is unique. Everything about the gameplay is different on every level. So uh, you have some integration with the Faces of the Sphere uh, expansion if you bought Deep Madness. But uh, otherwise, it's a whole new thing and entirely different. So uh, yeah, if you like the minis, if you like just the idea of exploring uh, those cosmic horror themes, body horror themes, Dawn of Madness might be for you. Uh, I... I really, really want to get uh, some games in a Deep Madness, but I'm in the middle of painting it. Uh, I'll show that stuff off later. But right now, you can go tech check out Dawn of Madness and, uh, and back it too, just like I did. That's about everything I could fit in. I didn't make it to the 21st. We made it to the 18th, but that's still pretty good. And we'll continue to go through the month, throw more stuff in. Uh, even today, more stuff was just dropping in with these short campaigns. So uh, I'll be putting more videos as I can. Uh, I've got a super crazy week this week, uh, just like over the weekend. <laughs> I did so much cooking, so much eating. Hope you did too, and uh, that you'll enjoy yourself. I've got leftovers to last forever. And uh, right now I'm going to go watch Knives Out. You guys have a good one, and uh, if you feel like it, go ahead and throw something in the comments about what games you liked, uh, which ones you're going to back, which you uh, are expecting to come up in the new year, or you know, just how you want to spend your winter. And uh, I'll keep coming out with videos and have another one next week. And we'll push further into December with all the cool stuff that's out there. Take it easy.